Hello, and welcome to Pitt's Theology Library's third and final Kessler Conversation of Spring 2021. My name is Bo Adams, and I serve as Director of Pitt's Theology Library at Emory University, home of the Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection. I'm excited to lead this series of conversations that invite us to consider the ongoing impact of the works that document the reforms of the 16th century in Europe, consistent with the Kessler Collection's mission to not only preserve these treasures of 500 years ago, but to further their impact and to challenge communities to learn from them. To that end, I'm joined today by Dr. Cynthia Molobida, who serves as Professor of Theological and Social Ethics at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary of California Lutheran University and the Church Divinity School of the Pacific. She's also the Director of Pacific Lutheran Center for Climate Justice and Faith, and she teaches as part of the core doctoral faculty at the Graduate Theological Union. Professor Molobita is a prolific and important voice for both the academy and the church. Prior to her current position at Pacific Lutheran, she served on the faculty of Seattle University. And throughout her career, she has taught courses in Christian ethics, public ministry, and climate justice, all topics she covers in her abundant scholarship. She is the author or co-author of dozens of articles and essays, as well as six books on topics ranging from church history, Christian ethics, and public ministry, the most recent being Bible and Ethics, A New Conversation, published by Fortress Press. In conversation with her academic work, she's long been a thought leader in her home church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, for which she has served as a theological consultant to the presiding bishop, and she's also worked as a health worker to support the ELCA's ministries in Central America. She's been a key contributor to cross-denominational conversations on economic justice, race, and climate change. So I see you can agree with me that I can think of no scholar who is better positioned to address our topic this semester of blessed be the poor, wealth and poverty in the 16th and 21st centuries. So Professor Molobita, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. As a reminder to our guests here today, um, as I talk and as we have a conversation, if you also have questions that you'd like to ask Professor Molobita, please type them in the Q&A section on the right side of the screen. And as we have time toward the end of our conversation, I will relay certain questions to her. But I'd like to begin with a very broad question. And that is like, I'd like to start by asking you to summarize for us your teaching and research interests. And particularly, I'm interested in learning how it is that you became interested in studying Martin Luther and economic matters of the 16th century as a lens for commentating on economic matters in the 21st century. Well, um, first, Dr. Adams, let me just thank you for creating and curating this truly important series of conversations. I'm so moved by the effort and the, the successful effort to bring to life the relevance of the, of the 16th century for us today. So thank you. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, the intersection of my interests in Martin Luther and in contemporary matters of economic justice would be a long story, um, but in short form, I think my interest was born in intense experiences I had in my early teen years of finding out that extreme poverty causes horrific suffering and that a lot of poverty is caused by economic practices and policies that could be changed. All of this was opened to me in my church youth group, what we call Luther League in those days. At a Luther League conference, when I was in middle school, I saw a film and it depicted the terrible exploitation of agricultural workers in Central America by global companies in order to produce our inexpensive fruit and other food. It just blew my mind. It seems so wrong and so contrary to what my faith said about how people should treat one another. So that really led me to years of work in Latin America. I mean, I went on through high school and college and then ended up with years of work in Latin America, and then to work with the directing the East Coast Office of the Center for Global Education at Oxford College, um, which brought me back and forth between the US and Central America. And eventually, 
I was really compelled to theological studies because I suspected deep in my soul that if we plumb the depths of Christian traditions, we would find wellsprings of moral spiritual power for work to build more just social structures, including economies. And I was right. Um, during my doctoral studies, I encountered Luther's ethic and spirituality of neighbor love and his economic ethics. And I realized that both are so relevant for today. He was denouncing economic exploitation of the poor by the rich because people are not so people are supposed to treat each other with love not with exploitation in fact as i was thinking about this i recalled and i think i'll never really forget um, during the the world trade organization protests in seattle in 1999 and that was a kind of energizing point for the global people's movement to build more just finance and economic structures during that very time, I was studying Luther's economic ethics. And to my great wonderment, I heard protesters saying the same things that Luther was saying against the emerging exploitative economy of his day, because he believed it was damaging poor people. And you know, I, I thought maybe I'm just reading this into Luther. So I tested it out. I was giving a lecture at Augustana College in Sioux Falls. And I decided to quote Luther and quote the protesters and see if I asked people to raise their hands to guess who was who. And they couldn't, they mm -hmm. got it wrong. They got the two mixed up. So that, uh, I'll just never forget that experience. Um, so fast forward, my teaching and my research are in one way or another, digging into how we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, how we can become people who respond to God's call to love your neighbor as yourself by working to undo unjust systems that damage other people to benefit others. So, so that's kind of the long trajectory in short order. Well, it's remarkable. And I love that you had a suspicion that Luther had something to say. And indeed, you did find it. But mm -hmm. I, I find it rather provocative, this idea that one that you articulate in your book, Healing the Broken World, where you say that Luther's teachings can contribute to a subversive moral spir spiritual agency for challenging unjust mm -hmm. systems. So can you clarify for us specific mm -hmm. teachings of Luther and how it mm -hmm. would work that you would translate those into our very different context here in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, well, well, let's start with subvert. Uh, to, to subvert, subversive means to undermine the power and authority of something, to overturn its ability to shape our lives. And moral agency refers to the agency or the power to move from the way things are toward the way things could be and ought be. Uh, that, that is to respond to what educator Parker Palmer, Parker Palmer calls the tragic gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. So I talk about moral spiritual agency rather than just moral agency to indicate my conviction that this power to live toward more just and compassionate world is really the power of the spirit, the Holy Spirit working within us. So the Holy Spirit is a source of moral agency for subverting exploitative systems that damage some people to enrich others. For example, Luther was rich in subversive moral agency, although of course he would not have used those terms. He subverted the power of the church in his day to damage people and enrich its own coffers by convincing people that they needed to pay for their salvation. Luther's teachings contribute in so many ways to subversive moral agency for us.
and particularly for challenging economic ideas and policies and practices that destroy so many people and create exorbitant wealth for some of us. Um, let, let, me, uh, let me just highlight one of Luther's teachings that I think contributes to subversive moral agency. And that is his understanding of who we are. That is his theological anthropology linked to his ethic of neighbor love. Luther's theological anthropology is utterly paradoxical and subversive. According to him, we are three things at one time. We are beloved, we are broken by sin, and we are the body of Christ's love. So we are beloved. Like the first principle of existence for Luther was that God's saving love for us is utterly unconditional. That is, we are beloved, regardless of whatever we do or don't do, regardless of whatever horrible things we do. We are beloved. And we cannot do anything to earn more of God's love. That was a radically subversive teaching in Luther's day. Life was all about earning God's favor. That is why people were seduced into spending their money on indulgences rather than the necessities that they needed. And it's a radically subversive countercultural teaching in our world. In our society, our life is full of people who believe we're not good enough. We need to do something or be something more to be worthy. We need to achieve more or be more beautiful or own something. Luther's teachers' teachings say no. We are first and foremost and forever beloved, regardless. Um, you know, I, I remember so vividly in my life, probably the most, maybe the, the touchstone of my life was learning this. I was desperately, um, I was filled with despair and partly because, and this was in my late teens, maybe 19, maybe 20. And I believed, uh, I, I was just filled with despair, partly because of my role as a white North American citizen, US citizen in the global world that was so full of exploitation. And I remember knocking on, I was desperate. And I went to visit a former youth leader, youth group leader. I knocked on his door. He was a dentist. I knocked on his dental office door. He looked at my face. He closed down his office. He must have filled someone's tooth with a quick cavity or filling or something. He closed it down and he took me out to a creek by in the forest. And he read to me from the book of Romans. And I will never forget being engulfed, completely embraced by an astounding love that I knew would never change. Um, I, I remember thinking I could sit like a bump on a log forever and do nothing. And this love for me would not change. So, so the point is we are beloved. But secondly for Luther, we are also broken by sin. We are, for example, parts of systemic sin, the sin of racism, the sin of causing climate change that is killing so many people. We must recognize the systemic sin that is woven into our lives in order to repent, which means to change direction. Without recognizing systemic sin, we cannot repent of it. But paradoxically, according to Luther, while broken by the pernicious presence of sin, we are also the body of God's love on earth. That is the third face of the human. And he was adamant, the living Christ and the Holy Spirit, the very spirit of God that dwelt within Jesus Christ abides within us. So as a result, we're shaped and we're formed to love others with God's justice-seeking love abiding within us. So 
That's what Luther meant by his famous two forms of righteousness. The first kind of righteousness reestablishes our relationship with God and puts us into a right relationship with God. And the second moves us into right relationships with others, a relationship that serves the well-being of others. That is to love others. So the impact of that, of course, depends upon just what is meant by the call to love, to love neighbor as self. But that is one of Luther's teachings, this amazing trifold moral anthropology. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm curious, you, you continue to use the term love. And I think for many of us, at least for me, I think about love in interpersonal terms. We love other people, but you're reading this ethic of love in a much broader sense. I mean, for you, it's almost an ecological, economic, political norm. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by love? And is this Luther's idea of love? Is this a new idea for him? Oh, uh, that, that's a wonderful question. It's, it's actually the main point of um, my book called Resisting Structural Evil, Love as an Ecological Economic Vocation. Um, and it is that love does not, as a biblical and theological norm, it does not apply only to interpersonal relations. It applies to whomever my life impacts in whatever way. And I suppose I learned that from Jesus and, and from, from Jesus' scriptures, what we call the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. But I also learned it from Luther who no doubt learned it from the Bible. Luther was who he was as a theologian, partly because of who he was as a biblical scholar. For Luther, love, like as the biblical and theological guide for life, is not primarily a feeling of affection or, or even compassion. Rather, it pertains to every aspect of life for the Christian, including economic life, because according to him, economic activity is basically an act in relationship to neighbor. And all relations with neighbor are normed by one thing. The Christian is to, is to serve the neighbor's well-being while also meeting the needs of self and household. If you're a Christian, then you are to reject economic practices that damage the well-being of the neighbor, especially the vulnerable. Um, Luther's time was, in the words of Walter Brandt, one of his translators, an economic revolution gradually transforming Germany from a nation of peasant agriculturalists into a society with at least the beginnings of a capitalist economy, end quote. Although, of course, that term was not existent at that time. Consequences of this included high prices, growing disparity of wealth, increasing poverty, especially of those with low or, or, or with a, a, of low income. The poor were, and here I'm citing Carter Lindbergh, another Luther scholar, the poor were a cheap labor pool for an expanding profit economy, end quote. Increasingly large scale international trade required capital which sought profitable investment. Thus, the ethics of capital transactions, our investing today, were in public discussion. In this context, Luther was a faith-inspired activist. He helped to establish a local social welfare system that provided material goods and created jobs, but he also denounced theologically certain aspects of this emerging economy that exploited poor people, including the freedom of capital from, from regulations. And Luther admonished preachers to do the same in their preaching. I love to say that when I encounter pastors who are told by their congregations, don't preach about economic matters, because Luther basically said, you better. Um, Hear Luther for a moment in his comments on the 10th commandment in, in the large catechism. Speaking of what he calls the free public market, he writes, daily the poor are defrauded, new burdens and high prices are imposed, 
Everyone misuses the market in his own willful, conceited, arrogant way, as if it were his right and privilege to sell his goods as dearly as he pleases without a word of criticism, end quote. Well, again, this sounds like <laughs> contemporary protesters of the quote unquote free market. Luther taught that Christians should reject widely accepted economic practices that undermine the well-being of poor people because Christians are called to love. And as alternatives, he established norms for everyday economic life that prioritized meeting human needs over maximizing profit. Just to illustrate, Christians, according to Luther, now, now get this, Christians must refuse to charge what the market will bear when selling products, if doing so jeopardizes the well-being of poor people. And Christians may not buy essential commodities when the price is low and sell when it's high. For doing that endangers the poor. They couldn't then afford those commodities. Economic activity. So, I mean, that is quite mind boggling when you think that that's the basis of economic life today. Buy when it's, if anyone has bought stocks ever, it's buy when the price is low and sell when the price is high. Um, he argued that economic activity should be subject to regulations. I'm going to quote Luther here. Selling ought not be an act that is entirely within your own power and discretion without law or limit. End quote. Civil authorities, he wrote, ought establish, I quote, rules and regulations, ceilings on prices. End quote. Um, again, that is um, quite counter to the idea of deregulation today. Finally, he admonishes pastors to, I quote, unmask hidden injustice. Um, in short, according to Luther, neighbor love as a guide for public life has at least three dimensions. One is love manifest in service. To the neighbor. And, and I would argue that many um, contemporary churches are good at this. Secondly, love manifests in disclosing and theologically denouncing oppression or exploitation of the vulnerable. And third, love manifests in ways of living that counter prevailing economic practices where they exploit the vulnerable or defy God in some other way. Now, those three forms of love are a pretty amazing message to contemporary Christians whose lives and relationships with neighbors around the globe are shaped today by economic practices that do damage to others. So that's a little sense of my understanding of love beyond the interpersonal in Luther's terms. Well, I think you give us a very good sense of how subversive that nature of love can be, right? I mean, what you just said is a, a complete upturning of the way we think about economic life today. So let me, let me step back and ask about Luther in general, because I think for many of us, certainly uh, this speaker, um, we think about Luther in terms of the kind of famous slogans of the Reformation, right? So we think about justification by grace through faith alone. And when you think about a figure like Luther in terms of these slogans, you start to think, well, I don't need to do anything to please God, right? I've been saved through faith. But yeah. you've just suggested that Luther is telling us that there is indeed a Christian imperative to fight unjust systems. So how do we hold these two ideas together, right? Justified by faith, but then also yeah. you must do. How do, how do those yeah. work together? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you just... Small question, right? You just right? ask a, a, a tremendously important question. Um, for Luther, and, and I would say very much for me as a Lutheran, what we do in the world, what we do to make the world better or to 
to serve the well-being of, of others has nothing to do with earning God's favor or getting salvation or making sure we go to heaven. And, and, and I know that, that that is a very pervasive thought in our world today. I used to ask undergraduates when I taught undergrads um, why they should be more. And astoundingly, large numbers of people said, in order to please God and, and go to heaven after we die. But for Luther, that's absolutely not the case. And for me, it's absolutely not the case. And that's kind of what that, that experience I had out in the woods by the creek with the book of Romans was all, and the love of God was all about. We are not, we are not in, in any way to think that or seek to win God's favor by what we do. What we do to serve others or to love is a result of already being saved, beloved by God and saved. Uh, because, um, can I say this? Well, for Luther, and this is not um, taught a great deal in Luther studies, but it is so real. For Luther, the love of God comes to dwell within us. Christ dwells within us and the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And that love is the love with which we serve the well-being of the other. Um, and knowing that we need not win God's favor basically frees up a lot of space and energy not to be proving oneself all the time, but to be uh, receiving and then living God's love into the world. So let me put it this way. I used to think that Christians were called first and foremost to love, to love God and then love self, neighbor, and all of creation. But I no longer think that I think that Christians are called first and foremost to receive and relish and trust the love of God and then to love God and love self, others, and all of creation. So, so that's how I, how I see it, and that's how I would respond to your question. Well, yeah. thank you. You've taken on a very uh, uh, large topic there, and, and I think the way that you put it in, in terms of uh, love as a kind of expression of God's love that has been shown to humanity, I think is, is quite nice. In all of this and, and everything that you've been saying, and, in, and indeed in all of these conversations this spring, we're involved in what, this is a fancy seminary word, but we're involved in the process of hermeneutics, and we're making a big hermeneutical leap. And indeed, what we mean, right, is we're taking teachings from 500 years ago and we're applying them to today. But we can't do that in a very kind of simplistic way because obviously the context in which Luther was working and writing were very different. Mm -hmm. And I love it. In one of your essays, you actually say, quote, that we can't advocate a direct and uncritical application of Luther's economic analysis or norms to our contemporary situation. And indeed, you point out, and again, this is a quote from you, Luther railed against uprooting the theological formulations of past teachers and depositing in them into his own context. So Luther himself was aware of this. So can I just ask the big question, what is the hermeneutical move? That is, how do we translate these old teachings into our very different American capitalistic context? Yeah. Um, I, I wanna go back for just half a minute to the previous question because I was distracted by having messed up my screen. I, I, I want to say very, very firmly that never should my admonitions to be, and my invitations to be involved in struggles for justice be read as seeking God's favor or salvation because they're not. I am so, my, the grounds of my life are in <laughs> knowing that, that that is a given regardless of what we do. So I want to say that very, very firmly. Then in response to the question you just raised, it's a really important question. We cannot simply say, Luther said this about economic life, now do it. Um, Luther said a great deal that we should not heed as a guide for living. 
He said a lot, in fact, that we should reject on the grounds that it actually betrays the call to love neighbor. His writings on Jewish people are a firm example of that. Luther's vitriolic um, writing against Jews and Judaism um, were part of the underpinnings of fascism, uh, of the Holocaust. And, and that is always to be remembered um, and queried. So, so the question becomes just how are we to learn from faith forebearers, including Luther, in light of the fact that they may have been highly flawed and may have taught things that we know were terribly wrong. So, so what, what is this? What right do I have to say to, to someone? Yes, listen to, to Luther's economic ethics, but reject mm -hmm. his ethics of how you treat Jewish people. On, on what grounds can I say that? It's a complex question with a lot of layers. Um, and I'll speak to it very personally. Um, at one point in my life, I left the church and I gave up learning from faith forebearers, partly because I could not see the value of being in and learning from such a flawed religious tradition as Christianity, including Lutheran Christianity. I saw that, that Christianity was integral to the colonization enterprise and the horrors that it wrought in Africa and the continents known as the Americas and parts of Asia. Um, and that, of course, isn't the only flaw. I saw that the church had undergirded fascism in Germany, the degradation of women throughout centuries, slavery in the US, and more. So I left the church, or at least I thought I had left. Um, and a number of things brought me back. One was a New Testament scholar, um, Dr. Sharon Ringy, who taught me that the, the word tradition in the New Testament is first used not as a noun, but as a verb. And it means to pass on. Um, and we think of it as to pass on the gospel, but it actually has two meanings. And the other is to betray, um, to pass on betrayal. For instance, when Judas betrayed Jesus into the hands of the Romans, the word is traditio the, in the Latin, the word is he traditioned him. So that really cracked open a whole new reality for me. And that was the reality that the church is going to both pass on and betray the gospel. Um, and that helped me to re-accept um, the church. The, that, that is part of being human that we will do that. So I teach that theology has a threefold task. One is critique. Critique of where the tradition, our practices and our beliefs are actually betraying the God that we seek to convey. Secondly, retrieve. That is retrieve the hidden, the repressed, the unrecorded, the ignored voices within the tradition that may be speaking the gospel. And third is to reconstruct, based on our critique and our retrieval, reconstruct um, as we understand uh, to be faithful in the context of today. So that, of course, calls for enormous vigilance, um, seeking to be alert, both for where our beliefs and practices convey the gospel and where they betray it. And this is a delicate and difficult walk of discernment because we're so apt to just justify or believe whatever pleases us and then claim that that is the conveying of the gospel rather than the betraying it. So back to Luther and, and, and that whole process of discernment is part of what theology is about and what ethics are about. But, and we could talk a long time about, about that process of discernment, but back to Luther in particular. Um, we, in Reformation traditions, are bound to be constantly discerning where he betrayed and where he passed on the gospel. And I would argue that his strong critique of exploitative economic practices is to be heeded because it is grounded so firmly in his basic theological claim. It is embedded in his basic theological claim. 
And that is that we are saved by the grace of God. And after receiving God's absolutely unearned saving love, we are to embody it in the world as neighbor love that serves people's well-being, especially vulnerable people. And love, neighbor love, as a biblical norm, challenges unjust systems and seeks justice. That's why in our that, that's why in, in the Lutheran Church, in our affirmation of baptism, as part of what we say, we say that God has made a covenant with the baptized that we will seek justice and peace in all the earth. That is grounded in that claim. Um, the claim that, and, and so Luther's economic ethics, which are found partly in his Eucharistic writings, his economic ethics are just uh, deeply inseparable from his basic claim. You are saved by the grace of God and called then to live God's love into the world. Uh, so, uh, so, so I would say that, that 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 hermeneutical key has to do with knowing that our traditions will both betray and pass on. And then knowing that our theologies and our work as Christians needs to be alert to that and then critique, critique and retrieve and reconstruct. Um, and if someone's teachings are embedded in their basic fundamental claims, then those teachings are worth reading. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to be so bold as to ask you to do a bit of this translation of Luther here on the fly, because America's current economic system seems to be focused on or defined by maximizing profit, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. But what you've written or you've talked about is strongly against this urge, and I suspect that you find the current American economic system to be wildly inconsistent with much of the church's history, historical teaching. So how can you help us understand a path forward for America and its own kind of, pardon the word, reform um, and moving away from this em emphasis on maximizing profit? Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, I worked, I was commissioned to work as a missionary in Honduras in Central America for two years doing health-related work. It was in a village and in the surrounding mountainous areas near the village. And then I spent years bringing delegations of opinion-making U.S. citizens to countries of Central America. And we would meet with all sectors of society. Um, later, I worked with the church in India and with unhoused women in Washington, D.C. and Seattle, with people of faith from Africa and Asia, and constantly I saw that people were poor, like devastatingly poor, in large part because systems were set up to enable our high levels of consumption at cheap prices and our financial gains, despite the fact that that meant exploiting other people in their lands. So, and this is getting at this question of maximizing profit. Um, just to illustrate what I mean by that, I'll never forget a Methodist bishop from Mozambique. I was working with the World Council of Churches on its efforts to, um, to contribute to what is called a new um, economic and financial international architecture. And we were 12 people sitting around a table and we were introducing ourselves. And this, we came to this person, this Methodist bishop from Mozambique and all he said was, I am Bishop, <clears throat> I am Bishop Bernardino Mandlate, and I am a debt warrior. So you go, what? His call as a bishop, he understood it was to work against the international debt levied against Mozambique and many other poor countries that was sucking out their money so that they couldn't take care of people. Or I'll never forget the strawberry picker in Central America who once looked at a delegation I was leading and she said, our children go hungry, you know, because this land grows strawberries for your tables and it should grow corn and beans for us. 
or the voice of John Sobrino, a Jesuit priest in El Salvador, part of the community that was actually massacred by uh, paramilitary forces. He was talking to a group of about 10 people in a delegation I was leading. We were sitting in his office and he said, I quote, in El Salvador, poverty means death and people are not poor because of because of a fault in them. They are poor because the systems that bring your wealth make them poor. Or the woman in Seattle who was in our church's shelter for homeless women because the retail store she had worked in didn't pay her enough to keep a roof over her head. These kinds of situations exist because some companies and their shareholders and the global finance system wanted to maximize profit. And I am, I'm so glad you used that term because I am not critiquing making a profit to support a modest standard of living. That's not the problem. The problem is maximizing profit and doing what it will take to do so. Luther's ethic and his spirituality of neighbor love basically say, are you kidding? No way. If you're a Christian, you may not maximize profit by investing in or doing business with companies that underpay workers or take people's water and sell it on the global market or toxify water supplies or spew greenhouse gases into the air. Moreover, you are to denounce such exploitation and work for policies that disallow it. Like Luther wrote a thousand letters to public officials. So that says to me that we Christians today are to be involved in many ways in changing the systems that maximize profit. And by many ways, I mean, um, I like to think of working on three levels. And one level is lifestyle. So changing how we eat and transport ourselves, what we buy, um, such that we um, work with companies that have records of not being exploitative, such that we don't buy, such that we buy fair trade products, not free trade products, such that we vastly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, our carbon footprint. But the second level, aside from behaviors, the second level is social structures, that we become adept in the arts of impacting structures. And that can be through public policy work. Most of the mainline denominations in the US have very avid public policy offices, advocacy offices that equip people for public policy change on state levels, on city levels, on national levels. Um, my denomination, the ELCA, has beautifully active public policy offices in states and, um, and, and nationally. So public policy is one means of systems change. Another means of systems change is um, working to change corporate structures. Um, so working for corporate social responsibility. But the third level of change is worldview. Um, and that includes uh, worldview and consciousness. And that includes theology, um, studying Bible and theology and worship that encourage us to see life and economy oriented around serving the good, not oriented around just individual, individual gain. I, um, I remember working with an organizer, a Lutheran organizer from India, and he had been up in the hinterlands, literally doing life-threatening organizing. He was organizing against bauxite companies that were destroying the homelands of many Indian people who had lived there for centuries. And he was working to get divestment from those companies. And he, on the systemic level, um, they were encouraging churches around church communities around the world to divest from the bauxite mines, much as we are now encouraging people to divest from the fossil fuel industry as part of systemic change. So, so that is on the second level of change, the systemic level. But this man, we were talking and I said to him, I said, in my country, there are many people who do have a lot 
of economic security and wealth, but don't seem to want to engage in change on behalf of economic justice. He said, oh, but that's the same in my country, in India. I said, oh, I said, so what is the solution to that? And remember, what I'm talking with you about now is, is worldview change, consciousness. He said to me, this man who had been organizing and doing all of this work, he said to me, why? The solution is biblical and theological reflection. In other words, he was saying, um, study your Bible and theology, do your worship so that it, it, it helps to re... And I think about the power of worldview and consciousness change in working with our youth and children in, in, in the church. And think about the power of them learning that they are to, you know, on that basic level, um, be good to their their friends at school and not be mean. <laughs> that That's a beginning of a countercultural wor wor worldview change. So um, I, I think the, the one of the paths forward is working on those three levels. And it is a consciousness change to think that economy is not meant to maximize the production of goods, services, and profit, but economy is meant to um, eco, economy from, from the Greek, um, the world, and nomos, the laws, the, 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 the mechanisms, so, so the, the rules for working with the resources of the earth, that's uh, of the world, that's what economos, economy is about. Um, and that is, how do we live within the world's resources in ways that serve the well-being, the flourishing of creation and all people, um, rather than this uh, strange understanding of economy as there to maximize production of goods and services and uh, production and consumption of goods and services and, and money. Um, so worldview change, um, lifestyle change and systems change, becoming the 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 mode of 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 seeking to live in with our neighbors in ways that serve well-being. Um, I I hope that speaks to your question a little bit. Well, I think it does. I mean, it's an overwhelming challenge, but what you've given us are very practical steps that on both an individual as well as a corporate level, I think we can make real substantive change with that. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, there was a question in the chat about specific steps, and I think you very well uh, have answered that. So I think we're about at the end of our time, and I want to thank you, Professor Moloboda, for your important insight, which is not only here in this conversation, but at least for me, has been throughout your scholarship. I've learned a lot, and I will continue to learn a lot. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, sometimes it's challenging, but I think that's the way that it should be. Oh, yeah. um, and I think you've given us a pathway how we to, to, to help us understand how we can answer the call of the reformers here in this context in America, which is so very different. So for all of us here at Pitts and Emory, thank you, thank you for your time and your, your wonderful insight. Mm -hmm. So her work, along with many of the other works that are mentioned here, will be distributed to all of our guests here in a comprehensive bibliography from all of our spring conversations. So don't feel like you have to write all of this down. We'll get all the information to you. This conversation, along with all of our Kessler conversations from last fall, as well as this spring, including conversations on this very topic with Professor Esther Chung Kim and Professor David Fink are all gonna be available to you online at pitts.emory.edu slash Kessler Conversations. I wanna thank all of our guests for your attention, your good questions, and I wanna wish you all a very safe rest of your week. And I look forward to seeing you again at our next mm -hmm. Pitts Theology Library mm -hmm. event. Thank you and have a great day. Mm -hmm. And goodbye all. Mm -hmm.